When I was a young man, many times I thanked God for my parents because I looked at classmates and their parents. I said, oh, thank God, this is not my family. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever looked at another family and said, I wish that was my family? Well, I want to tell you, from that point, I, I mean, I might have been 10 or 12, I purposed that I wanted my, my sons and my daughters to be thankful for me and my wife that we were their parents. And that meant I had to choose a woman that was not this strange woman adulteress who flatters. Welcome to the Basic Training Podcast. This is a weekly live recording of a course led by Dr. Robert Forney to several men at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The main topic of this course is how to be a man of God in today's society. Welcome to Basic Training. So I have a question. Apart from Jesus, in the Bible, who was the wisest man? When you think of a wise man, who do you think of? Solomon? Yeah, Solomon was Israel's third king. You know, there was Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. He's also known as Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. And in the Song of Solomon, we'll talk more about uh, his name. He reigned 40 years, and the 40 years of Solomon's reign is regarded as the golden age of Israel. They were at the uh, epitome of their power and their wealth. It was an age of prosperity and national unity. But in the end, his reign ended in a disaster. He began to oppress the people. He multiplied wives and introduced pagan worship. Solomon was the second son of David and Bathsheba. You recall that the first son uh, died as a result of David's sin with Bathsheba. He was the second son of so the, the oldest after that. David had other wives and sons by these other wives. So Solomon was actually, in terms of birth order, he was number 17 of 19 sons of David. And I'd like to start reading from uh, the book of 1 Kings chapter 3. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, ask something of me and I will give it to you. Solomon answered, you have shown great favor to your servant, my father David, because he behaved faithfully towards you with justice and an upright heart. And you have continued this great favor toward him. Even today, seating a son of his on his throne. So Solomon had already uh, ascended to the throne at this point. So Solomon continues speaking to the Lord. O Lord, my God, you have made me your servant king to succeed my father David, but I am a mere youth, not knowing at all how to act. I serve you in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a people so vast that it cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge your people and to distinguish right from wrong. For who is able to govern this vast people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon made this request. So God said to him, Because you have asked for this, not for long life for yourself, nor for riches, nor for the life of your enemies, but for understanding so that you may know what is right, I do as you requested. I give you a heart so wise and understanding that there has never been anyone like you up to now, and after you there will come no one to equal you. And the Lord did indeed grant Solomon great wisdom. In chapter 4 of 1 Kings, it's noted that his wisdom surpassed all the people of the East and also Egypt and credits Solomon with 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. Many of these have come down to us in the biblical books that he authored, including Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. Leaders throughout the world sought out Solomon for his wisdom and counsel, and most notably the Queen of Sheba. 
Solomon was also noted as a superb statement. He had great capacity to forge trading relationships with foreign leaders. Trade expanded greatly during his reign. Solomon had it all. He had wealth, fame, adoration, power. His house, for example, took twice as long to build as the temple, and it was called the House of the Cedars of Lebanon due to its massive cedar pillars. Every three years, ships came to his estate bringing gold, silver, ivory, and animals. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. This is Second Chronicles chapter 9. And all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gifts of art, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, mules, so much year by year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen, three trainers for every horse. And he stationed them in chariot cities. Solomon made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem. In other words, Solomon owned so many horses and chariots and employed so many trainers and horsemen, he had to build a city, not just a stable, but an entire city just to, just to house them. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon wrote, I enlarged my works, I built houses, I planted vineyards, I made gardens and parks, and I planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I collected silver and gold and the treasure of kings. I provided male and female singers. I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. And Solomon not only had it all, he tried it all. Solomon held back from nothing. He tried pleasure, business, recreation, sport, any thrill, you name it, Solomon did it. He said in Ecclesiastes 9, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Well, that's the good news. Unfortunately, there was bad news. Solomon's foreign entanglements from his expanded trade relations may well have been the first sign of his trouble. It led to him taking many wives. This was a common practice in the day of the kings, and yet the book of Deuteronomy warns kings and commands them not to do three things. Deuteronomy 17, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Solomon broke all three of these commands. He multiplied wives. In multiplying wives, Solomon took many of them from pagan territories. His wives included Hittites, Moabites, Edomites, Sidonites, Amorites. 1 Kings 11 records they were from many nations about which the Lord had told Israel, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. The scripture notes that in the end he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. This not only demonstrates his lust, but also his foreign entanglements. These pagan women brought with them their pagan deities, and in the end, they negatively influenced Solomon's own faith. At the dedication of the temple, God warned Solomon, But if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. So Solomon failed to heed this warning, and through lust, greed for trade, fascination with things foreign and pagan, he turned away from the Lord and began to allow pagan worship and pagan altars to be built in Israel, and he even built them himself. Of all his sins, this was clearly the most egregious, and the author of 1 Kings indicates that it is the main reason God turned his favor from Israel. So the Lord said to Solomon, 1 Kings 11, 
Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant, my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So he multiplied wives. He also multiplied gold and silver. We've already talked about that. And he multiplied horses. Now, this idea of multiplying horses, it wasn't necessarily that he liked to do uh, barrel racing or uh, dressage, but rather uh, this expression to multiply horses meant amassing a large army. In taking the kingship away from Adonijah, Solomon had acquired an inveterate enemies from the military commanders who had supported Adonijah. They camped in the north and often harassed Israel. Perhaps for this reason, but most likely for pride, Solomon amassed a huge army, including 12,000 horsemen and 1,400 charioteers. And of course, they had to go to Egypt to get a lot of these. So in the end, his failure to walk in wisdom as a middle-aged and older man came to light. The grand temple that Solomon built was overshadowed by temples of false gods that he built for pagan wives. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who would begin his reign after Solomon's death, had a reign that would simply be described as Rehoboam's reign of folly. The foolishness of Solomon now became enthroned in the folly of his son. Solomon's son would ascend the throne, living out nothing from the book of Proverbs. Rehoboam reflected nothing of godly wisdom and cared nothing for the ways of God. The kingdom of Israel divided from Judah as a result of Solomon's increasingly oppressive policies enacted by his sons. When Rehoboam followed his father's misguided policies, the ten tribes in the north had enough and they divided from Judah. The great unified kingdom ended and within less than 20 years, Israel, the ten tribes of the north, went into captivity, and later Judah did as well. After a few years after Solomon's death, the temple of God he built was destroyed. However, the pagan temple, shrines, and altars built for his pagan wives would stand for another 300 years. The personal legacy of Solomon, therefore, is not wisdom, but folly. So the reason I wanted to tell this story is to say, you know, it's one thing for a father to be wise, but the whole deal is shepherding your sons so that your sons are wise. And so that's the subject of this podcast. Fathers, instruct your children in wisdom. The task of every human father is to be for his children an image of the Father in heaven, that they may know the Father's authority and love and give their heart to him. Proverbs chapter 10 says this, A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. So this is about the book of Proverbs. And I want to say, I want to do an overview of the book of Proverbs. We're going to Uh, look carefully at the first four chapters, not all of chapter four, but much of uh, chapter four. But I'm going to do, make some comments about other chapters. And then I'm going to end, I want to end this podcast describing what does a wise man look like? What are the characteristics of a wise man? And these will all come from the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs in, in the Hebrew Bible, the, the titles of the books, that is the Old Testament, come from the first Hebrew word in each of the books. And so proverb actually translate the first word in the book of Proverbs. Uh, the Hebrew text, it's mashal. Uh, this is a general Hebrew term for any kind of verbal comparison. It includes similes, allegories, sermons, one-liners, proverbs, maxims, announcements, doctrinal revelations. It even includes some sermons, but within them, there's always comparisons. In the, in the verse from chapter 10 that I, I just read, a wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish son 
grieves the heart of his mother. And so there's a comparison about wise and fool and about father and mother. This would be typical of the book of Proverbs. Um, the parable Nathan used to confront David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, would also be called one of these Proverbs. Most of the mashal in the, in the book of mashal are two-line sayings in the form of parallelism. For example, uh, in Proverbs chapter 14, we read this, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. And so it's two lines, and there's this parallelism, a wise woman building, a foolish woman tearing down. Often there's also three and four line sayings. The two line sayings are more common, but there are many three and four line sayings that are put together in some combination of parallelism. And I'll give you an example of this from chapter 8, the first four verses. In other words, we need to read all four verses to get the entire thought, and the parallelism incurs in these four verses. Does not wisdom call, and understanding lift her voice? On the top of heights beside the way, where paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out, To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. And so this is a form of parallelism called a chiasm. A chiasm comes from the Greek word chi, or chi, C-H-I, and it's the Greek letter X. And so in a chiastic construct, as this is, there's parallelism. The first line and the fourth line are parallel, and the middle two lines are parallel. And so it's, it's sort of an A, B, B, A structure. So listen again. Verse 1, does not wisdom call? Verse 4, to you, O men, I call. So you see the parallelism between the first and fourth line. In the middle two, on the top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. That's verse 2. And verse 3, beside the gates at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out. So she takes her stand, she cries out. And so the she is the wisdom that calls. And so you see this is parallelism. So this is important because you don't want to take, for example, one of these four verses, you don't want to take just one of the verses as a complete thought. And so as you study Proverbs and as you teach it to your sons, you need to understand this structure so you can get exactly what is being said. So uh, if we there's more I could say about this, but moving on to a sort of an outline of the book of Proverbs, we can divide it by the by the way it's written. The first nine chapters are a set, and we sort of know that because chapter ten, verse one, which I just read, begins with the Proverbs of Solomon. It's sort of a title. And so we know that chapter 10 is set apart from the first nine chapters. And very interestingly, in the first nine chapters, wisdom and folly are contrasted. And so we get different attributes of both. As we go through this, I'm, I want to go through the first four of these chapters. In the first four, I will give you 12 lessons, 12 things that we can learn. This will increase our wisdom so wisdom is composed of different ideas, and these there are 12 of these in these first four chapters. There's many more as you go on through the nine chapters. So starting at verse 10, the Proverbs of Solomon, that goes through chapter 24. And then in, in chapter 25, again, we have a title. It says the Proverbs of Solomon, and it uh, footnotes and says, as set in order by the men of Hezekiah. And so this sets off beginning at chapter 25, and that goes through chapter 29. And then verse 30, another title, which says the Oracle of Agur. And then chapter 31 says Proverbs of a Mother to Lemuel. And so these sections are set off by these titles, Proverbs of Solomon, starting at chapter 10, and then more Proverbs of Solomon, but those found by the men of Hezekiah and added to the others, and then the oracles of Agur and, and Mother Lemuel. But the first nine chapters, I, 
it's hard to say they're most important. They're foundational. Let's say they're foundational. They'll help us as we look at that and figure out what's going on in these, these chapters that I want to review with you. I hope you can study the rest of the book and get some, uh, have some insight into how, how it's going and what it's about. Okay, so the chapter one begins with a lengthy introduction that in which Solomon expresses the purpose of his writing these proverbs, these mashals. And so therefore we, we want to know that as men because we first want to apply wisdom to our hearts. You know, teaching wisdom, you know, reading the Proverbs to our son is one thing, but what they need to do is they need to see it in us. And of course, none of us are as wise as Jesus, but we need to be growing in this wisdom and calling our sons to grow in it as well. And it's a wisdom applied that is explained. It's both the words and the actions put together that uh, is what's needed. So what are these purposes? Let's read them and see. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction. So that's the first purpose, to know wisdom and instruction. To discern the sayings of understanding. To receive instruction in wise behavior. So it's not just wisdom as ideas, but it's also wise behavior. Righteousness, justice, and equity. So wise behavior is composed of righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. You see the parallelism there? In verse 4, give prudence to the naive, to the youth. So in other words, the youth is naive, they're inexperienced. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man has discretion. Verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. Now, this is an important concept. We're going to see as we go through this that our sons need to know that wisdom is a riddle. It's a figure. It needs to be, it's a puzzle. Uh, it's not obvious. Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. And so God doesn't throw wisdom before pigs. In fact, he, he requires that a person is prudent, right? The prudent, a wise man will hear an increase in learning, but the fool won't, even though they hear the words because they're riddles, because they're figures, because they're this parallelism. That's the way God wants it. And if we're going to be wise, we need to apply our hearts to this. Okay, so if I can break down these, these nine chapters and their lessons, the first eight lessons are in the first five chapters, and they talk about the benefits of wisdom. And then uh, lessons 9, 10, and 11 are in chapter 6 and 7, and then the 12th lesson is in chapter 8, and then chapter 9 recapitulates with a summary of this contrast between wisdom and foolishness. So the solution to a man's need is to pursue wisdom, not pleasure, virtue, not immorality, and the fear of God rather than the fear of evil. This is what this section is going to teach us. The first lesson begins in chapter 1, verse 7, and goes uh, through verse 33. And lesson one, uh, I've, I'm calling the rewards of wisdom versus the seduction of immorality. Now, it's real interesting because here we have a contrast between wisdom, not and lack of wisdom, but between wisdom and unrighteousness. So already we have ideas and behavior being put together. The first uh, of these verses, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I don't know the first time I read that or heard it, but I thought, that, that can't be. I, I, who, who would despise instruction? Who, who wouldn't want to know? 
who wouldn't say, how can I do this? Or what's the best way? Or what was my mistake? It didn't work. Why didn't it work? What did I do wrong? What, is there anyone who would, who would do that? I was a young man when I, when I said that. And I have to tell you, and this is probably your experience too, I've seen lots of people like that. They just, they're not teachable. I mentioned, I think, in another podcast that for a couple of years I coached soccer. And I was amazed every kid on that team wanted to win, and most were not teachable. You'd tell them what to do to win, and they just wouldn't listen. But it's not just young people. It's everywhere. Uh, People are lacking in curiosity. Everybody thinks they're know-it-alls. And so the beginning of this, to be wise, is to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, the universe is so big, we can't imagine it. It is so powerful, we can't imagine it. God who created the universe is the single most important thing for us to understand. To not understand that is to not understand the universe. And if we don't understand the universe, it's hopeless that we're going to understand ourselves. And if we don't understand ourselves, we're going to be running into a lot of brick walls. And so, uh, the fear of the Lord is being in knowledge, but the whole book of Proverbs will expand on this thought. The next verse, verse 8 and 9, uh, begins with something that is characteristic throughout these nine chapters, and it is this phrase, my son. Solomon addresses his son. We have to think it was Rehoboam. And he says, hear my son. Now, the word hear is the word shema. It's the same word from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So this same Shema, Shema, my son, I think it's important for fathers to claim their sons by not calling them, hey, you, but identifying them and, and addressing them as son. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Now, this this practice, the graceful wreath and ornament, this idea has been carried from antiquity throughout the ages. The wreath uh, is like the laurel wreath that is put on the head of a champion. And the ornament about your neck is like the Olympic gold medal. Hearing your father's instruction and not forsaking your mother's teaching is like becoming a champion. It's receiving the wreath and the, and the gold medal of life. This instruction is for giving direction to life. He says, my son emphasizing family's responsibility for moral instruction. He says, listen, shema which means take note of in the sense of that you're going to obey. You're going to apply what uh, is being said. Uh, your, your father's instruction. This uh, word is musar, and it literally means discipline. So hear your father's discipline. This has a couple of ideas. One, to gain in knowledge and wisdom is to gain in discipline. The undisciplined life is a foolish life. It's a life lacking instruction. It's an incompetent life. Whereas by being instructed, when we instruct our sons, what we're doing is we're raising them in competence and in the favor of God because this competence is not competence to sin, but rather it's in righteousness. But the the second thing to be said is that normally it's the father's responsibility for doing this instruction uh, rather than the mother. It's the mother also teaches, don't forsake your mother's teaching. But the father is mentioned first, and this word instruction is used rather than the word teaching. Teaching is actually 
in this verse, it's actually the word Torah. And Torah means the law, and it refers to the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. And so the mother's giving the child the Torah, but the father giving the children instruction in the sense of discipline, not discipline in the sense of the rod, but discipline in the sense of competence and instruction. To forsake, it says, do not forsake your mother's teaching, is to, is to depart from or give no heed to. And so verse 9 tells us why. Indeed, they're a graceful wreath uh, to your head and ornaments about your neck. So they are the discipline, the musar, and the Torah, the teaching. Musar and Torah, discipline and teaching. They provide this wreath and ornament of a champion and a leader. So continuing, after these powerful beginning verses, the father again addresses his son. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Okay, this is a father who knows that there are sinners and who knows that sinners are not content to sin themselves, but they recruit others. And so in, in anticipation of what the world is really like, the father says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And he amplifies this and he says, if they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us an ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw your lot in with us. We shall have one purse. So in other words, this enticement is to its greed for wealth. It's violent. And it recognizes that innocent people are vulnerable. Let us ambush the innocent without a cause. It doesn't say, let's go vanquish the mighty without a cause but the target of sinners are always the most vulnerable. And the father anticipates this and tells his son, listen, this is what the world is like. And then in verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. Their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. Now, you understand that? What, there's, what he's saying is, don't walk in the way. They don't understand that by running to evil, they're actually laying a trap for their own lives. Thinking that they're taking from others, in doing it, they're taking from themselves as well. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors, that is, those who gain by violence. And, and sin is violence. It's violence against God. It's violence against our own futures. Now, contrast, verse 20, wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. Okay, and so the father says, wisdom is calling. There is, it's not just the enticement of sinners. The enticement of sinners and their speech and their recruitment is being set against wisdom, which is the Spirit of God, who is also calling out, is also recruiting. And it says, wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. We might say, wisdom shouts on social media. Now, I don't know that it does, but uh, in previous era, uh, in my era, it would have been uh, at the soda fountain or the uh, drive around root beer stand because that's where we went uh, after a football game on Friday night. Everyone in high school would take their cars and drive to one of these these root beer places, and there were always uh, high school girls bringing the root beer out, and you'd drive around, you'd see who was there, and you'd honk your horn and whatever, 
And there was a lot of mischief created through conversation uh, among those groups. And so in this same place, wisdom shouts in these public areas where people gather, indeed where the sinners are actually gathering, doing their enticement. And so the father's saying, listen to wisdom, not to these sinners. She shouts, shouts in the street. At the entrance of the gates, she cries, she utters her saints, how long O oh, naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. How long will fools hate knowledge? How long will naive ones love being naive? Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. So the father starts with this. Don't depart from your mother's teaching. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. What is your father's instruction? Do not consent when you're enticed. Recognize enticement. Recognize that those who are enticing are setting a trap for their own lives. They're destroying themselves. Just say no. Don't even walk with them. Their feet run to evil. They set traps for themselves. Wisdom, on the other hand, cries openly. Very often this enticement is secret. It's whispers. But the wisdom cries openly. It berates the naive, the fools, and the scoffers. And it warns those who are wise to heed its reproof. And so this is, this is the beginning of wisdom. It ties, it understands the nature of people, that there are people out there enticing to sin, and that wisdom, the Spirit of God, is calling to reprove, to teach, to guide, to lead into life. And so the Father's first instruction is recognize this Son, understand, discern. A wise will have discretion, will understand different kinds of people in different situations. And then chapter 1 continues with, and this is the first lesson. We're still on the first of 12 lessons. This is the length, the lengthiest of all of them. And it's, in my view, it's the foundation for all of them, the rewards of wisdom versus the seduction of immorality. Okay, so now we, we come to the fate of the foolish versus the fate of the wise. Verse 24, wisdom is still speaking. Because I called and you refused. Now listen to this very carefully. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention and you neglected my counsel and didn't want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call on me, but I will not answer. Okay, so this is, this is so important. Wisdom calls, and when wisdom is, re re is rejected, calamity results. And when calamity results, wisdom laughs at the calamity. Then the fool calls out, but it's too late. I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Now you say, why? Well, this is mean. I thought God was good. Why would God do this? Well, the Father instructs, the Holy Spirit instructs and explains this. Verse 29, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof, so they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. So it's a law of nature that if you begin fool and then you give in to foolishness and you practice foolishness and you recruit others into the foolishness of sin and you grow in this, wisdom is far from you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And at this point, what the fool fears is the consequence of his sin rather than God. And so the the only thing that's left is, here's the judgment. You get to sleep in the bed you made. 
you get to eat the fruit of your sin and be satisfied with your own devices rather than to be satisfied with the blessings that God wants to give us. So the summary is this, and this is this parallelism again. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. So fools are defined by several things. Fools refuse the call, they refuse the outstretched arm, they neglect the counsel, and they spurn the reproof or the correction. So the fools refuse the call, but even then when they're corrected, they spurn it. The wise, on the other hand, they're just one characteristic. They fear the Lord and they listen to him. What's the fate? God laughs at the calamity of fools, turns deaf ear on their cry, allows them to be punished by their own devices, and they're killed. The wise, on the other hand, are safe, secure, and without the fear of of evil. That's really interesting. By fearing the Lord, they're without the fear of evil. So that's pretty big first lesson. Learn to discern good and evil, to recognize sinners and fools and not think that everyone is wise and that anyone who's got any idea, it's probably a good idea. Rather, learn to discern and say, is this true? Is this good? Is this wise? Okay, lesson two is in chapter two, and there's uh, an if-then conditional promise Start in starting this. Uh, it starts the same way. Another interesting thing about Proverbs 2 it consists of 22 lines. This is interesting because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, our alphabet has 26, but Hebrew has only 22. So there are 22 lines, the same number of letters. Now, the reason why this is important is because the beginning of the stanzas begins with a letter of the alphabet. So the first letter of the first three stanzas is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, three stanzas. Well, and then it goes on to Beth, which is the second uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The last three st stanzas all begin with the Hebrew letter, Lamed. Now that's the middle letter of the alphabet. And so there's 22 lines, but there's not 22 different letters. It's an acrostic. Uh, this is not uncommon, actually, in Scripture to have an acrostic, to have the first letter represent something. Uh, some have suggested this is a memory aid. It's a, a way of poetry. Maybe you've heard the Mother's Day poem, M is for the many things she does, and so forth, using each letter of the word mother to describe a mother. Well, this is sort of the technique in this second chapter. Okay, but it's an if-then. So reading the first four verses. Verse 1, my son, notice the repetition of the calling to his son, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, for if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure. Okay, so this the conditional is, that we got to want to be wise. We recognize that there's foolishness and that it's destroying people. Uh, I used to uh, stand in the narthex of a church on weddings. And when the happy couple would come out, I would look for an opportunity to speak to the groom. And I would whisper in his ear, you know, everybody's happy on their wedding day. But it's amazing to me how rapidly that happiness flies away. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how many unhappy people in the first year of marriage? Have you noticed how many divorces there are, even among Christians? What makes you different? 
You think the feelings you have this afternoon is wisdom? You think this is what makes for a good marriage? I want to tell you, everyone that is miserable was happy on their wedding day. What makes you different? Right? No one thinks like this. But a person seeking wisdom wants to know, why are some people happily married for 32 years and others can't make it 32 weeks? What's the difference? Well, if we seek for this wisdom, so discerning right and wrong, but that's not enough. It's necessary, but it's not enough. The this, this second lesson is, got to seek it like silver and gold. In other words, you got to really want it. Why? It's a riddle. It's not obvious. Most don't find it. There are lots more fools than there are wise people. Do your sons know this? Are you teaching them? Is your life, is my life, characterized by wisdom or by folly? And it's conditional. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, verse 5, we get the then, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. And so we have to really want to be wise. We have to ask these questions. Why? What is this? How do I do that? What should I do in this situation? And very often, what human nature says to do comes from our sin nature and is actually the foolishness. And it's the wisdom of God that is this riddle, that is this mystery, that is openly revealed in, Pro in Proverbs and other places in Scripture, and yet neglected by so many people, even in the church, that we have to understand that God is going to say, okay, I'm not pouring my pearls before swine. Prove to me that you really want to gain knowledge. Do you really want to know? Then you will discern the fear of the Lord. Then you will understand and gain knowledge. And then you'll have this shield from evil. And that's why the wise person need not fear evil. Well, God gives wisdom. It doesn't come out of books. It doesn't even come out of the book of Proverbs. It's the Spirit of the Lord working with Proverbs and through Proverbs that gives this. With wisdom comes righteousness with pleasure and protection. Verse 9, then, this is the second then, you will discern righteousness and justice and equity and every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant in your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. So with wisdom comes righteousness with pleasure and protection. Specifically, the deliverance from evil and evil people is uh, recorded in verses 12 through 15. And then wisdom also affords more protection in verses 16 through 19. But uh, in 12 through 15, wisdom will deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. In verse 16, to deliver you, it's repeated, from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. So wisdom will deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, and it will deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. Wow, a pretty girl flattering a young man is such a temptation. It is a strong temptation. I know. I've been there. Uh, in many ways, you know, and you can tell your daughters, be very careful about whom, whom they flatter because it will stir up a man's heart. Uh, we have this need to feel strong and capable. And when a, when a girl does this, but wisdom delivers us from evil men and from these, it's called a strange woman, a weirdo. Not weird in the world's eyes, 
weird in God's eyes, an adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companions of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. When I first came to the medical school where I've been on the faculty for many years, I was a single man, and there was a very sensuous, fun woman, and she she behaved in ways that were quite alluring. It was hard not to look at her, and she would flirt. Boy, would she flirt. Now, being a doctor, and she was not, and I go, well, who is this? I had questions about any pretty girl who is sensuous and flirting, and especially with other men, with various men, with single men. And I found out she was divorced. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. That was hard. There was no question about that. These verses were such a protection to me to deliver you from the strange woman. And I said no. She even asked me out. I said no. And then she went after another guy. And it became a disaster. I said, oh. <laughs> when I was a young man, Many times I thank God for my parents because I looked at classmates and their parents. I said, oh, thank God that those, this is not my family. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever looked at another family and said, I wish that was my family? Well, I want to tell you from that point, I, I mean, I might have been 10 or 12. I purposed that I wanted my, my sons and my daughters to be thankful for me and my wife that we were their parents. And that meant I had to choose a woman that was not this strange woman adulteress who flatters. So... Such an important lesson. Evil man. What are the characteristics of these evil people that we can recognize them? Evil man speaks perverse things. Evil woman flatters with words. So they both speak, and there's parallelism here. The evil man leaves paths of righteousness. The evil woman also leaves. She deserts the lover of her youth, and she deserts God. The evil man delights in the perversity of evil, and the evil woman, her house sinks down to death. Evil man is devious in his ways. The evil woman, none who go to her survive. And so there are these parallels between the evil man and the evil woman. Uh, but there are resulting blessings to those who are wise. So in verse 20, he continues, so you will walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness for the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. Okay, so that's lesson two. Lesson three, the admonition to follow wisdom in relationships. So see how this wisdom is so tied into our relationship with other people. And it, this continues. And really, you can look and identify a wise person by his relationships with other people and the contrast with the relationships that evil people have with other people. So um, this, this particular lesson to follow wisdom in relationships consists of six couplets of two verses each. And each couplet is either a command or a prohibition. It's either positive or ne negative, 
and it's followed by a statement of motivation. So we have a, a positive or negative statement, then a, the obverse, negative, positive, motivation, positive, negative, motivation, and so on. So the first couplet, negative, do not forget your father's teaching. Now, this is in this case, it's not the word discipline, but teaching, which is Torah. Positive, keep my commandments. That's the mitzvah. The commandment is a mitzvah. Motivation, prolong your days, prolong your life. Okay, the second couplet, negative. Do not let love and faithfulness forsake you. Positive, bind love and faithfulness around your neck and write them on your heart. Motivation. By this you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Ah, remember we're to grow in stature and wisdom and in favor with God and with man. Well, how do we grow in favor with God and man? Here this couplet tells us, do not let love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind love and faithfulness around your neck and write them on your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Third couplet, positive. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him always. Negative. Do not lean on your own understanding. Motivation. He'll make your path straight. If you trust God and don't lean on your own understanding. See, this is this mystery of wisdom. It's a riddle because our own understanding is not what we should trust, but what we should trust is what the Lord has is teaching us. Then we'll, our paths will be straight. Fourth couplet, negative. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Positive. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Motivation. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Fifth couplet, positive. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. This couplet is positive, positive. And you go, wait a minute. This isn't balanced. Ah, but just hang on. Positive, positive. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Motivation. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. In other words, generosity towards God will be reciprocated with generosity from God. Gen generosity toward God, generosity from God. Six couplet, negative, negative. See, it balances the fifth. Negative, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. Motivation, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves as a father, a son in whom he delights. And so we have these six wonderful couplets with motivation for each one. It's very interesting in the book of Proverbs, again and again, this is, is said that the Father teaches, and we are to teach, not only what we are to do in gaining wisdom, but why, what the, what the reward of that is. Chapter 3 goes on, and I'm just going to summarize this, um, starting at verse 13, we have a commendation of the way of wisdom, a hymn to praise to wisdom, the most valuable possession, that wisdom was essential to the creation of the world, that wisdom enables a long and safe life. Either fear God or you will fear your circumstances. Therefore, take confidence in the Lord. Then the end of chapter 3, And we only have nine verses in chapter four, so we're, we're getting towards the end here. Verse 25 begins with a series of prohibitions. Verses 25, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31 all begin with the words, do not. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor to come back, but give to your neighbor. Do not plot harm against your neighbor. Do not accuse a man for no reason for when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. And the motivation that's given is the Lord detests a perverse man but takes delight in the upright. 
The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the name of the righteous. The Lord mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honor, but fools are held up in shame. Therefore, don't emulate the wicked. Okay, chapter 4 is the fourth of these 12 lessons. I'm going to list the 12 lessons, but we're only doing this expository teaching through verse 9 of chapter 4. So in chapter 4, we have something new, and that is, heed your grandfather's old Torah wisdom. So this is acknowledging that wise sons come from wise fathers, and that wise fathers themselves had wise fathers. And so this is the father speaking to the son. Hear, O sons, the instructions of your father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching, that's Torah. Do not abandon my instruction, that's the discipline. When I was a son to my father, tender, that means naive, and the only son in the sight of my mother, Then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live, acquire wisdom, acquire understanding, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth, do not forsake her and she will guard you, love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom and with all your acquiring, get understanding, prize her and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you will embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. That's a lengthy quote that the father is making of the grandfather. He's saying, listen, son, this is what my father taught me. He said, acquire wisdom, seek it, and it's going to be this garland of grace and the crown of beauty. Well, that's where this father began with his son and he got it from his father. You know, growing up, I told what I call grandpa stories. I wanted my sons especially, but my daughter also, to know my father. And because I was so old when I married, they didn't have much time to meet my dad. Um, My youngest son, Daniel, my dad smiled so much when he saw Daniel. He was so happy, but he died shortly thereafter. A month later, he was, he was gone. And so my dad would only live as I described him to my sons. Now, many of the, sons, the stories I told were fun stories. Uh, I made them laugh. Uh, dad was a very humorous guy. And he loved telling stories of things he did that were awkward or mistakes or whatever that would end in uh, a humorous uh, conclusion. By doing this, I wanted my sons to love my dad so that when I said, you know, dad always said prudence and fortitude, get wisdom and be courageous that they'd know who I was talking about. I was talking about their grandfather. And the wisdom that I have, much of it, whatever it is, actually comes from my father and his father. So this starts, hear, O sons, the Shema replace again. Give heed, listen. Of all the instructions in these first nine chapters, This one here in chapter four is the most intimately family values because it links a grandfather, a father, and a son in the pursuit of wisdom. Instead of the customary address, my son, this starts here, O sons, plural. An exhortation to heed the father's teaching, and it comes from the grandfather, and it comes from scripture, and it comes from God. This is what the grandfather said, get wisdom and don't forget it. Don't forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get it. Prize wisdom and she will exalt you. Now, this is actually a fun thing. The word for prize there is actually the Hebrew word that means to lift up. 
Well, to lift up is exalt. So we might say this is what the verse is. Exalt wisdom and wisdom will exalt you. That's the conclusion of the grandfather's instruction to the son. Okay, I want to go through the remaining 5 through 12 lessons in these first nine chapters, and we'll go through these very quickly. Lesson 5 is an admonition to live righteously, chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Listen, my son, is repeated. The command to accept the word of the father is more active and almost aggressive, like take, grasp, snatch wisdom. Wisdom is the path or way that a son must walk, and his way will not be hampered. He won't stumble. And he contrasts two different ways of life, nervous insecurity with the confidence of a person who has gained wisdom. Wisdom is the light of the dawn breaking the darkness of night with sunlight. That's the fifth lesson. The sixth lesson, also in chapter 4, the end of the chapter, verses 20 through 27, is an admonition to concentrate on righteous living. So this lesson has to do with behavior. The first five have really emphasized the wisdom part of recognizing, discerning, discretion, you know, the discretion, the pursuit. But now we're talking about the behavior and its righteousness. It's an exhortation to give allegiance and follow the path of wisdom, but doing this with a series of commands. Watch over your heart with all diligence. From, fr from it flow the springs of life. Put away the perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your mouth. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Make level paths for your feet. And so this, using the parts of the body, the heart, the mouth, the eyes, the feet, and keep them on the path of righteousness. That's the sixth lesson. Seventh lesson, Proverbs 5, admonition to avoid the seduction of evil. My son, pay attention to my wisdom, the father pleads. Avoid the strange woman. The description of the praying uh, of the strange woman. Her lips drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as gall. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her path is crooked. She's ignorant. Then specific commands and prohibitions. Don't turn aside from what the Father says. Keep the path far from the strange women. Don't go even near her door. Don't flirt with her. Don't even think about it. Consequences. You will groan at the end of your life. You will regret hating the discipline, spurning correction in your heart, and not obeying your teachers. You will say, I've come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the assembly. So, and this chapter concludes with an exhortation to be captivated by the love of your wife. And we'll actually come back to this in the as we talk about um, sex in the future podcast when we talk about loving our wives. It says, drink water from your own cistern. That, the cistern there is a metaphor for your wife. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving doe, may her breasts satisfy you always and may you be captivated by her love. Why be captivated by an adulteress? A man's ways are in full view of the Lord. The evil deeds of a man ensnare him. Okay, lesson eight, warning against the seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. They are haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to run to evil, a false witness, who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. So these seven, in the handout, I've contrasted them with seven godly virtues. So the first is lust, and the virtue is chastity. Gluttony, moderation. Greed, patience. Sloth, diligence. Wrath, kindness. Envy, generosity. Pride, humility. In the last four lessons, lesson nine in chapter six, verses 20 through 35, is a warning against adultery. Lesson 10 is a warning against the adulteress. That's in chapter seven. And then 
11 is an appeal to wisdom, and 12 is a summary of the whole thing, the consequences of accepting uh, the invitations of wisdom versus accepting those of folly. Okay, I want to conclude our time together with a description of a wise man from Proverbs. I'm not going to give you the references. The references are on the handout, but these all come from various places in the entire book, not just the first nine chapters. So uh, we're going to talk about three things. One, a wise man's character, then his relationships, and third, his speech, his words. First, his character. One, he's teachable. He receives and loves instruction and grows in wisdom. Two, he's righteous, not wicked. Now, we all sin, but he repents. It's a continual confession and repenting and striving and working towards righteousness. He does this by fearing the Lord, hating what is evil and false, doing, practicing righteousness, and speaking the truth. So, secondly, he's righteous, not wicked. Third, he's humble, not proud. Fourth, he's self controlled, not indulgent, self indulgent or rash. And then he's forgiving, but not vindictive. And being forgiving, he's patient. He's concerned about goodwill and peace. He forgives those who wrong him, and he's not seeking revenge. So then the relationships of a wise man. First to the Lord. He fears the Lord, trusts the Lord, is mindful of the Lord, chooses the Lord, his way and his wisdom. He submits to the Lord, and he confesses his sin. And then his relationship to his family, to his parents, he honors and respects them. He listens to them. He seeks to bring them honor and joy by being wise himself, by being righteous himself, and by being diligent, working hard. Then his relationship to his wife, he appreciates her as a gift from the Lord, as his crowning glory. He treats her as his crowning glory, a gift from the Lord. He praises her he trusts her, and he's faithful to her. And to his children, the wise man loves them, is concerned about them, trains them that they may have peace of mind and joy and honor and well-being. And he teaches and instructs them and disciplines them. So both the uh, discipline uh, instruction that I spoke about at the beginning and the Torah instruction, the words that bring wisdom. And by disciplining them, by both verbal correction and by physical discipline. And then he provides for his children, both their physical and spiritual needs. To his friends and neighbors, to his friends he values them, he's faithful to them, and he gives them wise counsel. To his neighbors, he fulfills his obligations, he strives for peace, he does not outstay his welcome, he does not deceive or mislead. And then the words of the wise man. He recognizes the power of his words, that his words have the power of life and death, that they have the power to heal or to wound. He knows the limitations of his words. He knows that his words are not a substitute for deeds or actions. He knows that his words don't alter the facts, and he knows that his words cannot compel others to respond. But the character of his words, they're honest, not false. They're few, not many. They're not boastful. They're not argumentative, contentious. He's not a gossip, revealing secrets or spreading slander. They are calm, not emotional, rational, gentle, peaceable, persuasive. They are apt. That means they are timely. They're not untimely. The source of his words come from his heart, his character, his righteousness, the source of his his words comes from his humility, from his compassion, from his companions, and from his reflections on life. Well, that's a lot of stuff, but I think it's a good picture that Proverbs gives us of what it's like to be a wise and godly man, and the two go hand in hand. If you're not wise, you're not going to be godly, and if you're not godly, you're not going to be wise. So I have seven applications. Are you convinced that shepherding your sons and daughters in godliness in the home is better than succeeding in the world? Do your words and actions convey this to them? 
especially your actions. Do you Second, do you teach your children the word of God and implore them to hide it in their heart? Third, do you testify to your children about the Lord's work in your life where you have followed and been blessed, the mistakes you have made? Do you tell them what you have learned of wisdom through your spiritual fathers and your actual fathers where that applies and the specific instructions they gave you, the specific instructions? Four, are you, not your wife, you being an example to them as well as giving them instruction as well as your wife? The wives do this, but are you doing it? and being an example, not being like Solomon, who was wise, but he was not a good example. Five, do your children believe in their heart that their greatest development will be in godly wisdom and not in academic achievement, not in sports, not in social standing, not in wealth, but in godly wisdom, that this is their greatest achievement? Six, do your children believe in their heart that their greatest deeds will be finding and doing God's will? By the way, these last two, they're only going to value godly wisdom if you value it. They're only going to be believing that the greatest deeds will be those done in God's will if that's what you are doing. And then lastly, is your children's greatest passion a hunger and thirst for the Lord? And let me leave you with these two encouragements. It's never too late to start shepherding your children. And two, it's always too early to quit. Father, thank you for giving to us your spirit and your word and the desire that we seek you like silver and gold and that we listen and pursue your wisdom. Thank you for the gift of wisdom and discernment and understanding and knowledge. Lord, may we not neglect this or spurn it. And Father, I pray that you empower the men and those listening, that they may be wise and walk in wisdom and grow in wisdom as Jesus grew in wisdom, and that they may teach and discipline their sons and daughters in it as well, and that the blessings that you promise may magnify and enlarge that your son Jesus would be glorified and many would turn to him. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Basic Training Podcast, taught by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available on Spotify and the Google and Apple Podcast apps, also on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you want to contact us with any comments or questions, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and God bless. Any questions, gentlemen? Thoughts? Have any of you used the book of Proverbs in your instruction? Yeah. Some of you had, yeah. I saw a hand in the back. What is your, what is your comment? My son's um, environmental. What are some practical ways that you can start teaching your children how to be wise men and women at a really young age? I mean, when you, like right now, when we do kind of worship and stuff, we'll be, we're training him to like sit still and be quiet and, you know, not scream and stuff. And then you read the Bible and praying and stuff like that, but. That's a great question. Uh, I, I will tell you the way my dad taught me and the way I've tried to teach my sons. There's a place for just going through the scriptures. We had a, uh, we were home educating, and in our home education, there was some memory work in the book of Proverbs. But you need to understand that while that's good, that can put some the Proverbs in the head. It's not yet, um, as the Proverbs himself said, we, it needs to turn into behavior. So in terms of turning into behavior, so much of this is discernment. Um, 
much of the difference between the wise and the fool is that the wise is able to discern, is able to say this and not this. And so, uh, you know, it can start with um, being on the floor with your kids, putting blocks together, you know, and they try to put a square peg in a round hole. And you, and you sort of start with this or this, you know, this or this. Um, and uh, I remember, this is uh, silly, uh, my dad and I went to uh, a movie our whole family did with one of my with my mother's oldest brother, and uh, and their family, and uh, my mother's oldest brother drove a Cadillac. We were quite middle class, you know. We we drove a Chevy and it was old, but anyway, he drove a Cadillac and he was like vice president of a company and um, a very nice man, but. Um, uh, we got in a car and we left the parking lot and he wouldn't listen to my dad's instruction, which was offered in the form of a, a suggestion about which way we should go. And so he went and turned left and dad leaned over to me and said, watch son, watch him drive around the block and end up back where we started. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Dad was showing me in a very practical way that when you don't listen to advice, when someone says, do this and you do that, and the person who tells you to do this knows what they're talking about, and the other person who's from out of town and was unfamiliar with one-way streets and, you know, mandatory left turns and whatever, um, that's what happens. So I, I offer that. That's never going to happen in, in anyone's life like that. But what I'm saying is I think really with young young children, even in just the, the, the comings and goings of life, there are all sorts of little wisdoms. You know, uh, the way in which groceries are sacked in a sack. You know, you don't put bread on the bottom and throw heavy cans on top of it. You smash the bread. You know, and so you, you know, oh, well, the way this person sacks the groceries, you know, they put the cans in the bottom. <laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? Whatever. And I, I really think it, it's, it's Proverbs. It's right and wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss that. But life is just full of these choices. It's full of perceiving and judging and discerning right and good and proper and this is the smooth way and whatever. Uh, my dad, uh, another thing he said is there's two kinds of people. There are chess players and non-chess players. And so my grandfather was a champion chess player, W. Scott. And my dad was very good. And his two brothers were also very good chess players. Why? Grandfather taught them. Right? Well, why chess players? Because there are moves in chess that look really good where you lose your queen. <laughs> you know, oops, didn't see that. But a real chess player looks four or five moves ahead. And he says, well, this looked good for three moves, and then it's a trap. So I'm not going to do these first moves that look so good because I'm going for the long game. Well, that being able to look ahead, you know, to be able to make these distinctions rather than to just be looking at your shoes all the time, you know, and taking one step without looking at the horizon or where you're going. Uh, I've flown in, in airplanes a lot. I have a number of friends who are pilots, and I sat in the cockpit, and they've said, take it. And it's real interesting. You know, you can, be, you, you can think you're flying east, but the wind is blowing you off course. You know, and the, the plane continues to be pointing in the right direction, but your progress is to the side. And so you end up way south of where you thought you were going to be. Well, this is, I mean, life is just full of these things, you know. And so I think especially, you know, you point this out as they are, and, and especially when they're humorous. And, and that, you know, a humble man, is it's self-deprecating humor. It's not just making fun of others. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. Those are really weird 
applications, but that's what I would, that's what I think my grandfather would say. <laughs> and my dad said it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks you guys are princes sitting on those folding chairs for this length of time, listening to an old man babble. Take the scripture and put it in your heart, you know, and make it, you love it and your kids, your kids will follow you. Right, Daniel? Is it, is it Daniel? I asked you that before. You go by Dan or Daniel? Daniel? Yeah. I mean, and, you can be whatever you want. You can call me Danny, Daniel. I don't know. Okay. Well, I knew you as Danny, but I want to honor your, your growth. I have no preference. Okay. Great. Good. <laughs> you all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Love your wives. Love your wives. Let your kids see you being as excited about your wife as they are about the gifts under the tree. Okay? Public displays of affection, please. Right? <laughs> now, oh, I mean, there's a situation where your wife doesn't want you to do that. So you, you be wise. <laughs> Don't be foolish about this. Right. Okay. So our next, our next time is going to be January 9th. That's, I think, three weeks, two weeks, two weeks, I think, from tonight. I hope you'll join us. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thank you.